You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. I'm Alex Rodriguez. And I'm Jason Kelly. From Bloomberg, this is The Deal. Each week, you will hear us in conversation with business icons. This show will explore deal-making across sports, media, and entertainment. That is a harsh lesson in business. Sports is not and, as um, simple you know, I, as bringing a bunch of big names together. I didn't want to do another stomp you out speech. It opened so, up so many you know, more doors. The show is called The, the deal. deal. Listen to The Deal. Listen to The Deal on Spotify. You, you feel this, this nervousness on the phone there? Sir, I've been trying to make an urgent phone call up there. Well, I don't think it's something I want to do on an overseas phone. You got to make some phone calls. Hang up the phone. Prank caller. Prank caller. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. Actually, this is Packernet After Dark. I don't know, man. It is what it is. This is the call-in one. Title should have given that away. We'll figure it out. We'll figure this thing out, man. If you'd like to call into the show, you can do so at 608-501-0718. New callers go to the front of the line. We do have a new caller today, so we're going to go ahead and start with that. I don't have a massive amount of time, so it'll probably be a little bit of a shortened episode so that I can at least get one out today. But Mr. New Caller, Mrs. New Caller, whoever you are, go ahead. Hi. Hi. This is George from New York. All right. Packer fan since the 60s. George, New York. One question that nobody's been asking is, what would have happened if the Packers had not drafted Jordan Love mm-hmm. and instead drafted T. Higgins? T. Higgins has already been to one Super Bowl. He's one of the key reasons why the Bengals are one of the top four. Any good offensive, the best offensive teams in the NFL have what? Two number one wide receivers. What would have happened in that Buccaneers championship game if Rodgers was throwing over the middle to T. Higgins instead of Alan Lazard? Most likely, that is a completion, at least a 10 or a 14 point swing. The Packers win the game and now beat Kansas City with their offensive line problems. The best offenses in the league have two number one wide receivers. Ben Fennel who was interviewed by Andy Herman a couple of weeks ago, suggested that Brian Gutekunst should be fired. Why? Because of the timing of the Aaron Rodgers trade. When it was made in the beginning, the old the timing was a mess. And that's why we're in this situation right now. We're trying to close this. We, by drafting Jordan Love, we basically closed our own Super Bowl window. Potentially cost us two Super Bowls already and a winning season this year. If Auntie Adams would have left, we would have had T. Higgins. We still would have had one number one receiver. Inexcusable. Not only that, you look at his draft record. Every third-round draft pick has been a bust. Oh, it's a curse. Baloney. He blew every third-round draft. All right, there, there's so much that I'm, uh, I'm trying to let you get all the way through but I'm already forgetting half of the things you've said. Uh, look, the the I think the quarterback situation, any way you slice it, it's been somewhat of a debacle. Um, now, if Jordan Love ends up being a great quarterback, then everybody who's ever complained about that pick was wrong, flat out. Um, but you can go all the way back to Deshaun Kaiser, right? That was like his first move as the executive was to trade away our safety for Deshaun Kaiser. He came in and that was a complete joke. And then we drafted Jordan Love, which everybody thought was a terrible pick. Nobody really liked Jordan Love. Um, But the thought was that Aaron Rodgers was going to be out the door. Then he goes and wins MVP. Again, hindsight, you couldn't have known that that was going to happen, but now you got to commit. So now you got this first round pick that's sitting on the bench, but you got this MVP guy. And now we've got the situation where you can clearly look at it and say, and I don't really think this is super debatable, Rodgers should have been traded prior to this year, should have been traded last year. That would have been maximum value. We could have gotten out of the last year's debacle. We could not could have gotten out of this absolute monstrosity of a contract, all that, right? So that's that's number one. Now, to pretend that, in my mind, that's a fireable offense, we've got to set up some, uh, some ground rules, I think, for what would be a fireable offense. Because again, I don't want to lack any context. 
And this is what Mr. Negative uh, used to text me like daily. And I would ask him, you know, show me, show me any GM that you respect. And he would say, you know, Bill Belichick. Okay. And then we go through his draft. Absolute joke of a draft. Probably last three or four have been abysmal. We go through all these different, all the first round pick, Nikhil freaking Harry and all these different guys and be like, so, so should, should he be fired? Is he, oh, no, 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 no. Because obviously he's, I like him. So he, everything he does is acceptable, but everything Gutekunst does that isn't perfect is not acceptable. Taking a quarterback who is the highest up on your board, the most valuable position when Aaron Rodgers is on the downswing of his career, has had like one good year in the last four years. It's not that big of a thing. Again, hindsight is fine. But the thought process at the time is what I care about, and I don't think it was terrible. And again, it's not over yet. And even if it was a bad decision, everybody drafts somebody in the first round, and most of those picks are not great. Now, on to the T. Higgins thing. Um, I think it's, let's just say, completely, entirely inaccurate to assume that we would have won two Super Bowls. You said that it cost us two Super Bowls. I think that's way (laughs) out of left field. T. Higgins is a good football player. There's no doubt about it. And yes, it would have been better. First of all, the idea that, you know, all the good teams have two first, two number ones, I think is debatable. In my mind, a number one is a top 32 wide receiver. Kansas City Chiefs best receiver ranks 41st. And even if we're going to call Tyreek Hill a receiver, which he technically is, that's one. It's not two. Everybody said that at the time because, well, they have two and everybody else has two. And then they lost one and they didn't, they didn't lose anything, right? They did not go back at all. So I'm debating or, or not entirely sure that I'm sold on the idea that if you don't have two top end wide receivers, you can't do it. But looking back and saying, I know that T Higgins, again, it's the whole butterfly effect thing. The idea that we would have been in that exact same situation with that exact same down distance and everything else would have been the exact same if, if T. Higgins was there and um, on that pass he would have thrown it to T. Higgins because we would have run the exact same uh, play in that exact same situation and the exact same call in the exact same time and the other team would have had the exact same defense and the exact same thing and Aaron Rodgers would have made the exact same decision thrown the exact same ball with the exact same velocity and everything else, except it would have been T. Higgins in that exact same spot, and he, it would have been a good pass to the right guy, and he would have caught it, and it would have been a touchdown, and then that exact score would have been the end, and we would have won. That is not how anything works. We would have been in a wildly different situation with a different record, a different offense, a different everything. Whether or not we would have even been in that game with that team, much less how that all pans out, who knows. But beyond that, I mean... Yeah. First of all, maybe. It was a close game, so it's you, you could look at it and say that the margin was close enough that had we added another pretty good wide receiver, T. Higgins is the 25th ranked wide receiver in football um, this year. Um, mostly, he's, he's not really that fantastic. I know he's got over 1,000 yards and he's got seven touchdowns and everything, but he's got one, two, three, four games of 70 or higher via PFF. That's it. But even as a rookie, and his rookie year was his worst year. So he's not like a top 10, top 5 type of receiver. He's a solid number 2. So you're right, they do have two number 2s. Barely, but they do have two number 2s. But, again, I look back at that game, and I see an offensive line that was completely incompetent. We had no run game, no ability to block, pass blocking or run blocking, partially due to injury, partially just due to pure dominance. A quarterback that was absolutely scared for his life, had no time to throw, and when he did throw, it was a complete joke and a disaster. So when you have offensive line, running back, quarterback, wide receiver, and coaching problems, it's hard for me to say drop in a you know low-end number one wide receiver, and you can guarantee that not only do we, if we're assuming we're even in that situation, not only do I guarantee we win that game, but we would win the next game, and we'd go to the Super Bowl, and we'd win that game, and then the next year, we'd get, get go to the playoffs and win all those games, and then go to the Super Bowl again, and then win that one. I, I'm going to go ahead and say that I would bet a lot of money that that would not have happened. I mean, the fact of the matter is we did have Devontae Adams, who is significantly better. And I know you said two wide receivers, but, but listen to me. When you have the MVP of the league, let's go back to 2020, the not even close number one quarterback in all of football, 
the not even close number one wide receiver in football. It's not that it's the best pairing. I'm talking about number one quarterback and number one wide receiver. And you've had a, an offensive line that has been competent all year, and you have a very good running back duo, and all you can do is put up 10 points. That is some serious, serious issues. And to blame that on Brian Gutekunst to me is wild. It's not, it's not to say that it wasn't the wrong decision. It's Every single day we're getting closer to saying, yeah, it could have been T. Higgins. By the way, it's, it's also completely disingenuous to say it should have been that one guy. Why not one of the other 15, 20 guys that was drafted in and around that period that was a failure? We always want to look at the one guy that was good and not all the other guys, as though you can just pick that one. If we would have picked somebody else, what's the odds it was even T. Higgins? Again, we look at it as Gutekunst was uniquely stupid because he took Jordan Love. Well, the next pick was Jordan Brooks. That guy sucks. The next pick was Patrick Queen. That guy's not good. The next pick was Isaiah Wilson. He's not even in the NFL anymore. The next pick was cornerback Noah Igbenogany. I'm not entirely sure what he's doing. The next pick was Jeff Gladney by the Minnesota Vikings. He's not in the NFL anymore. The next pick was Clyde edwards alaire first-round running back that has not even improved their, their run game. What if Kansas City had drafted T. Higgins? Then this year, rather than having no Tyreek Hill and basically no good wide receivers, they would have had T. Higgins. But you know what? We're not complaining about it because the Kansas City Chiefs are able to overcome whatever issues they've had, and they've been able to continue what they're doing rather than complaining and whining about the GM not getting us what we need. Because they have the right quarterback, they have the right tight end, they have the right coach, they have the right people, putting the right people in the right positions that man up and do their job and, and go out and execute. But the Packers, and a lot of Packer fans, no offense, like to complain about all these things and say, well, it's not perfect enough. It's not perfect. It's the GM's fault because it's not perfect enough. You know who doesn't complain? The guys who go to the Super Bowl. Joe Burrow, who's been playing behind one of the worst offensive lines in football this entire time, doesn't complain about it. The Kansas City Chiefs not making excuses about it. So look, we can play this game where every single year you take any team and say, look at the, I mean, I just did it not too long ago with this past uh, draft. You had the... uh, the team that drafted um, Derek Stingley at pick three was the Houston Texans. Ahmad Gardner went one pick later. Or how about all the teams that could have taken Christian Watson and didn't? Or all the guys that we could have taken instead of Christian Watson, but we took Christian Watson. It doesn't work in reverse. We don't say, wow, there were like 15 players around that pick that sucked, and we got the one that didn't. Same thing that happened with Elton Jenkins. How many great players are drafted around Elton Jenkins? Not very many. But Elton Jenkins is that one bright spot. What about Zach Tom? How many really good players are drafted around the time Zach Tom was drafted? Not very many. So yeah, we look at Jordan Love and say we could have had T. Higgins. Right, we could have had Michael Pittman too. What if we had drafted Michael Pittman? Do we win? What if we had drafted DeAndre Swift or Xavier McKinney or Kyle Duggar or Yuturn Gross Matos or Robert Hunt or Ross Blacklock, who is not even with the Houston Texans anymore? He went to the Minnesota Vikings, which you want to talk about a GM doing something stupid. That guy was terrible with the Texans. They paid to get Ross Blacklock. He's still terrible. That was a complete joke. How many picks around this time were any good? Almost none. I think that's the biggest issue I have. I mean, you, Again, you're, it's not really debatable that T. Higgins would have been a good pick. You're right. And you know what? We could, have, we could have moved up one. If we could have got up one pick further, we could have gotten Brandon Ayuk, who the 49ers took. That was also a good pick. Before that was Cesar Ruiz. Don't believe that was a good pick. I don't know. I haven't heard his name. Kenneth Murray was a bad pick, but then you got Justin Jefferson. Oh, boy, if we'd had Justin Jefferson, how much that would have changed everything. Philadelphia Eagles won pick before Justin Jefferson took Jalen Rager. This stuff happens, man. The quarterback playing in the NFC Championship game was the last player taken in the draft last year. So, you know, look, I mean, there's nothing wrong with going back and looking at the big picture and saying... Here is is a reasonable expectation for what GMs seem to be doing. Here's their hit rate. Here's their miss rate. Here's their process. Here's all these things. And how does this person line up? Here's my expectation. And maybe I just have lower expectations than most fans for what GMs do. But I look at Gutekunst and I say, yeah, I wish it would have been a little better. But I think the hit rate is pretty solid. I like the process. I've always liked the Packers in their process of best player available. Um, and so I, that's just, I'm on board with it. But what I don't really like is looking at one pick and then picking a random player that went later that's, that's proving something and saying, that's why you suck. That doesn't make any sense. Again, Justin Jefferson went at pick 22. Pretty much every pick prior to that was a failure. Joe Burrow, great pick. 
Chase Young, eh, I would probably have, rather have Justin Jefferson than Chase Young. Jeff Okuda, that's a freaking joke. That's the third pick in the draft, Jeff Okuda. The guy was fighting for his job this year in Detroit. Andrew Thomas, solid tackle. Would I take Jeff, uh, Justin Jefferson over him? I might. Tua Tungavailoa, I don't even know if he's going to be playing football much longer. Justin Herbert, solid pick. Derek Brown, defensive tackle for the Panthers. No idea, I haven't heard his name. Isaiah Simmons, that's a freaking joke at pick eight. He was supposed to be this transcendent linebacker that's like a safety linebacker hybrid freak of the universe. He's terrible. They drafted a first-round linebacker the very next year because he's terrible. C.J. Henderson, uh, Jedrick Wills in Cleveland, uh, Mekhi Becton, who the Jets apparently want to move on from because they just don't like him. Henry Ruggs, who's in prison. Tristan Wirfs is solid. Would I take him over uh, Justin Jefferson? Eh. I am all about offensive line, but I don't know, dude. Javon Kinlaw, what a crap pick that is. Jerry Judy, I don't care how much hype that guy gets. That is a failure of a pick, especially since Justin Jefferson was sitting on the board. But again, I can't look at the 49ers taking Javon Kinlaw at 14 when Justin Jefferson's on the board and say that the 49ers are failures because they've got a very good track record. So similar to how I said, I want to wait until Rodgers is gone and get the final calculation and figure out what's going on with his contract. I think that's true of a lot of players as well. I don't want to look at Jordan Love, even though he's been on the team a long time. I don't want to look at him at this point and say, all right, we know what what that situation is, and it was a failure, and and that's it. I want to wait and see. It's unlikely, but it was unlikely the second we drafted him that he was going to be a star. Just like whoever it is we drafted in the first round this year. You know what? I'm giving it a less than 50% chance he's a superstar. Right here, right now on this podcast, I'm telling you that. Unlikely that he is even a top 32, much less top 10 player this year extremely unlikely. And the fact that he is a transcendent player that is up in the the Hall of Fame someday, pretty close to zero. But let's just wait and see what happens. Positive and negative. We're anointing Christian Watson as this elite player. I'm going to talk about that a lot tomorrow. We don't know what the guy's going to be. No idea. So, again, I, I, yes. In almost every single pick Gutekunst has ever made, you can find a player that went later that's better. But I don't see that as a proper process. And I'm certainly not going to take it to the extent of saying, had we done that, we would have... I mean, yes, if, if Gutekunst had always picked the best player available, I mean, the actual, like if you can go back in time, the best player available, we probably would have won tons of Super Bowls. That's true of just about every single team ever. Where would the Bears be right now if they had drafted Patrick Mahomes instead of Mitch Trubisky? Now, yes, that guy did get fired. But again, I mean, th- this, is, this is every single team all the time. And I want to be honest, most of this stuff is luck. That's what it is. It's luck. That's why, you know, I'm doing that whole big board thing that's based on numbers. If you talk to anybody, like, that's stupid. That's not how you do this. You know what? There is no way to do this. Because the best of the best talent evaluators in the entire world are going to get 90% of their evaluations wrong. You know how easy it would be to pull receipts on these, especially since everybody's so positive in draft time? You listen to the way that they describe these guys. If we went back and looked at the 2020 draft and listened to the way you know, whether it's the Draft Network or whoever, the way that they talk about Chase Young and Jeff Okuda and, and, and all these guys, uh, Isaiah Sim. oh my goodness, the way they talked about Isaiah Simmons. You could pull, I, you could do a, a full, you could do a podcast, a, a YouTube channel. What, it's just, it's like laughing at the enemy, but it's laughing at the draft evaluators. How stupid they sound. And they sound so sure of themselves about everything. And I'm not mad about it. I mean, it's just what you do. You're having fun. It's like, oh, yeah, this guy's he's got this. And da, da, da. But, but it's just, it is kind of funny because we sound so technical and so professional talking about, you know, using all the big words, all the fancy terminology that all the scouts use. And they spend hours and hours and weeks and years and months of their lives dedicating themselves to understanding the craft of evaluation. And they use all the big words to, to, to come to a conclusion. And they can't get the first pick right talking about how great this guy is going to be this first pick in the draft and can't miss prospect and he sucks it's a crapshoot so if you want to fire Gutekunst and find the guy that's going to give you the right pick that would have taken T Higgins over uh, Jordan Love I'm sure they're out there but as they would have gotten that right they would have gotten everything else wrong and finally as far as the third round thing I mean I, I, I guess I don't fully understand the point to say well it's not a it's not a curse well of course it's not a curse I don't think many people think it's actually a curse but I mean, it, it, Ted Thompson couldn't hit a first-round pick to save his life. I'd much rather have a guy missing the third round 
than the than the first round, especially considering he's got an incredible fourth round track record. I mean, our offensive line is stacked with fourth and sixth rounders. That's pretty rare. The amount of mid to late round talent that we have on this team is fairly rare. That's what I was saying before. They're talking about how, you know, going back in in retrospect and looking at who had the best draft. And I think it was, uh, I think they were talking about like the Jets or something. And it, it was, if you look at, they had like four really good players. All four of them were drafted before the Packers picked. It's easy to be a really good drafter if you have three picks in the top 15. I mean, maybe easy is the wrong word, but certainly might have a, a, a much better chance of having a, a good draft, at least as far as first round or, or first year production when you're doing that than anybody else. <sighs> so, uh, yeah, I think, uh, I think I've covered it. Should he have taken T. Higgins? Yeah, probably. We'll see what happens to Jordan Love. But, but that's the thing. Even if you get to the point where I say definitively, so what? So what? That's true of every GM every year. You should have taken this guy, but you took that guy. Bengals lost in the Super Bowl last year. They took, uh, they got their quarterback early first round two years ago, then they got Jamar early first round last year. But what did they do in the second round? They took Jackson Carmen. Jackson Carmen was a terrible offensive lineman. You know who's been a really good offensive lineman? Sam Cosme. He went one, two, three, four, five picks later uh, by the Washington football team. How beneficial would it have been to get a young, talented, offensive tackle instead of that bust Jackson Carmen. They could have won the Super Bowl. See what I mean? I can do that with everybody. So I understand the frustration. But if this is the expectation we set, we're never not going to be miserable. How about last year when we drafted Eric Stokes? Gregory Rousseau went a, a one pick later. That dude's running wild in Buffalo right now. Javon Holland went shortly after. Landon Dickerson, the center, already went to the Pro Bowl. But you know what? You've also got uh, Travis Etienne, who's not really doing a ton for the Jaguars, at least not worth what he was given. Caleb Farley, Quiddy Pay, Kadarius Toney, Peyton Turner. Some of these guys might be okay. I don't know, but you get it, right? And I know we're not going to agree on it. There, there are the T. Higgins people, out, and, and it's the same with uh, several other picks. If you look at one or two picks later, it would have been huge. But for me, honestly, that's part of what makes the draft exciting. Knowing that it's not as much about evaluation, it is a part of it, but it it more or less just gives you, a good evaluator gives you a slightly better edge in this complete game of chance. But what's exciting about it is it's almost like there's these landmines out there, and you're very unlikely to step on one. Maybe landmine is a wrong analogy, but you're very unlikely to hit on these these gold mines. It's like a scratch-off ticket. You're real unlikely to hit it. But once every 50 or so, you're going to win something. That's the draft. You're just wondering if this is one of those just absolute freakish studs that just gets, you know, especially in the first, second round, but also third round, fourth round, fifth round, sixth round, seventh round occasionally. There's these guys that it's like, dang, I can't believe they got that. How did everybody else miss it? Anyways, I wanted to do 15 minutes and then a break, but um, why don't we go ahead and take a break and we'll come back and maybe get one more question in. Hey, U.S. Cellular customers, I've got good news, so don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event, Us Days. What's us days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. Us days at U.S. Cellular, exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda. You never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price. Priceline. I'm Alex Rodriguez. And I'm Jason Kelly. From Bloomberg, this is The Deal. Each week, you will hear us in conversation with business icons. This show will explore deal-making across sports, media, and entertainment. That is a harsh lesson in business. Sports is not as simple as bringing a bunch of big names together. I didn't want to do another stomp you out speech. It opened up so many more doors. The show is called The The Deal. Deal. Listen to The Deal. 
Listen to The Deal on Spotify. Hey, Ryan, there's another question. I know, obviously, Roger. By the way, it just dawned on me. I don't think I finished his... <laughs> I don't think I finished his call. Um, let, let me just listen to it. All right. He was just talking about the third round thing. We kind of addressed that. Anyways, I apologize. Go on, Trevor. Hey, Ryan. There's another question. I know, obviously, yeah. Rodgers is the biggest cap implication. Um, outside of him, I was wondering what's like the five or ten biggest um, contracts coming up this year because we're obviously over the cap. And even if we Rodgers does go and we save that $60 million, we still need more money. So, um just curious, like the five, ten biggest, like what are they on their hook going into their last year? Do they have some future years where, you know, things could be adjusted? Obviously, obviously we don't want to keep adjusting to where we have even more dead crap in the future, but adjusted in a way that makes sense, you know, um, or are they just cut candidates? Like, you know, obviously we've talked about Aaron Jones. Um, are they extension candidates? You know, just kind of curious where else is the best opportunity to free up some money other than Aaron Rodgers. Uh, go back, go. Yeah, so there's actually five guys that are above $20 million, which is just staggering. Aaron Rodgers, 31.6. David Bakhtiari, 28.8, which is another one that's extremely high. I know he's a tackle, which is valuable, but $30 million against the cap is wild. Um, Kenny Clark is at just under 24. Jair is at 20.2. And Aaron Jones is at 20. Um, talked about it ad nauseum already, but the one that clearly stands out to me here is Aaron Jones. <laughs> Because you're talking about quarterback, left tackle, uh, defensive tackle, and cornerback. Running back has no place in that conversation. But anyways, again, we're not going to pay 20. That's obviously coming down or just being eliminated. As far as restructures, I, you know, I don't exactly know um, what the hard and fast rules are on that. I mean, I can look at it and just say, you know, we could convert whatever into whatever. Um, I, I think the biggest thing is looking for those guys who, who are – because again, there's going to be big spikes in the salary cap. And so if if there's a you know twenty percent spike in the salary cap next year, which there's expected to be roughly about eighteen point two percent or something, but let's just call it twenty percent. If there's a twenty percent jump in the salary cap, that means if, for example, Jair Alexander, if his cap hit goes up twenty percent, it didn't go up at all. So in Jair's case, if you take his let's just round it to twenty million. Uh, 20% increase or the 18 point whatever puts it at $3.6 million increase. So for it to just stay the same, it would need to jump next year up to 23.6. His cap hit next year is 22. And then the year after that is 23. So if you take the 20% and apply that to the 20, let's just say it's about 24 ish. Jair's cap hit in 2025 would need to be about $28 million just to stay on, on track with the $20 million. It's only at 23 and a half. So his, his, cap, his cap hit is actually going down as a percentage every single year. In fact, it's $25.5 million in 2026. So it doesn't even hit the 28, you know, whatever, even a year later. So this is a perfect opportunity to, for example, take a little bit of that money and start kicking it down the road a little bit. Because if you can structure it in such a way, and, and you kind of can't because you're evenly distributing it, but I think the way that you do that is you restructure it this year, and then maybe you do a smaller restructure next year, which sounds stupid. Like, why do you keep kicking it down the, the, the you know, kicking the can down the road? But assuming you're not getting carried away with how much you're doing, you can set it up so that you're kind of staggering it like stairs to match the inflation that goes along with the salary cap. So I think Jair makes sense. Because again, anybody's salary cap that is going down, as far as their percentage of the cap hit is going down every year, that to me is somebody that makes sense that you'd want to kind of push some of that money back. Kenny Clark isn't really that way, but maybe a little bit. His is a little bit more complicated because next year is almost the exact same, but then you've got void years. And I don't know exactly how this works if you have to treat void years um, as actual years on a contract, because what happens is when you take a a bonus. Say we take $10 million and we just write a check and put it in your pocket. You take the $10 million, you divide it up by the remaining years evenly. So it'd be $2.5 million across four years, including this year. Well, there's two years, this year, next year, and two void years. So would I have to do across all four, or is that like a separate thing that I did before, And but with this bonus, it's still just seen as the two years? I don't exactly know how that works. 
But the reason that matters is because if I did take the $2.5 million per year, if there's two void years, it doesn't matter how many void years there are. The year that he's gone, it all goes into one. So that two point five million per year is essentially $5 million. He's already got $5.4 million in void years. In, in, in money in his void years. If you tack on another $5 million, you're talking $10.5 million after he leaves that you'd be paying for him. It's a lot of money, right? Like, it would be easy enough if I could just take maybe $3 million and tack it on to 2024, and then it's, it's like a spike, but it's probably about in line with inflation, so it goes down to twenty, and then his next year goes up to like twenty seven, which is probably a little high, but whatever. You know, which is, in other words, if I could just take a little bit and put it over there, it'd be kind of nice, but I don't think we can do that. And then David Bakhtiari, there's really not a lot of room there either. I mean, you could do something with void years, which essentially all we'd be doing is adding on another year. So we'd be taking, we'd be accepting that in 2025, we're going to pay for him to not be here. Unless, of course, we wanted to give him an extension. But at 31 years old, with another year still left on the contract and severe knee, knee injuries, I don't think that's going to happen. And the problem I have with doing this is, I don't want to have a year where we have $50 million in dead cap hits because we just keep pushing money out. We're doing it for, you know, Bakhtiari and Kenny Clark and whoever else is going to have this situation. I don't want to spend all this money. But I think that would be pretty much the only option. Because if you restructure, all you're doing is lowering this cap hit and just adding it into one year, which is next year. And that's already going from 29 up to 33. It's already relatively high. Now, as a percentage, maybe it's not quite high enough, but these are still really big numbers. And so, you know, if you're asking me, and we may not have a choice because we're so kind of strapped right now, but um, if you're giving me a choice, I think I would prefer to just leave it as is. Let's play out this year, see how he does. If he has severe injury issues, we let him go in 2024. That way we've absorbed a lot of that money in 2023 so that when we let him go in 2024, it's not as big of a hit. If we restructure, we're taking some of our responsibilities this year and adding it on to next year. So instead of having $11.5 million dead cap it, which is going to save us a ton of money, $22 million in savings, instead of saving 22, we end up saving 15 or whatever it is because we just pushed a bunch of money onto this. I'd rather just eat as much as we can this year so that when we do eventually move on, it doesn't sting as much. Uh, Rogers, you know, again, there was a lot of talk about him moving money around. I think that had to do with the 60 million that the team would take on when they saw him, they would spread that money out. The Packers already have the money spread out. So, um, I don't really see any way to move money around with Rogers. I think the problem is it, it gets worse as time goes on and it gets more and more painful on the back end, as opposed to the front end, this is the least painful year. So it doesn't make sense to relieve pain this year and add it to where we have more pain points in the future. Um, So Jair makes the absolute most sense to me. And again, guys are more than happy to do this because all it is is more guaranteed money. As soon as I write you a check and I put it in your pocket, that's guaranteed money. They can't take it back, right? Um, So yeah, I mean, uh, I I don't know why, other than it it makes your, your contract less palatable down the line, meaning you put you, like, look at Aaron Jones. The reason we're even discussing him possibly not being on the team is because it's his contract is a pain point. We wouldn't even be really talking about it if, if it was a normal cap hit of like $12 million or something. So you don't want to be in that position where the team feels that they have to move on or you need to play at just this extremely ridiculous level to justify your contract. But other than that, there's no reason why a, a player wouldn't take a salary restructure. Not that it's up to them anyways, but why they would be opposed to that. A lot of people think that it, it's because we're reducing our salary cap, like we're cutting their money or we're, we're pushing back when we pay them. No, no, they're, they're getting a big old lump sum payment. So they're fine with it. Some of that money that was not guaranteed that they haven't earned yet, we're just going to cut you a check for it right now. Here's $10 million. Thanks for helping us out. It's like, yeah, dude, any t- <laughs> I'll be happy to, I thought you were going to ask me to move some furniture or something. You want, you want to hand me $10 million? Okay, yeah, sure. I will help you anytime. But again, guys like Ken Ingles and whatnot, I, I'm, I'm, I have a very cursory understanding and just based on kind of what seems to make sense, there's, I'm sure, a lot more nuanced rules to how all these things work and, uh, you know, prorated bonus, roster bonus, game day bonus, workout bonus, all these different bonuses and cap hits and cash versus cap and dead cap, base salary. And then are, there's all the, the guarantees and there's different kinds of guarantees and all these different things and terms and it's eh, I don't need to know it 
that detailed, so I'm not going to do the work to learn it that detailed to be able to talk about it, but I'll do my best. So again, that's just from a logical standpoint, what I'm telling you about the Jair thing. If, if you see somebody's percentage going down, it makes sense that you'd want to at least that make that flat, if not, you know, maybe it's slightly going upward as far as your percentage. Now, don't get me wrong. I would love for more contracts to be structured like this, where it goes from 20 to 22 to 23 to 25, where it goes up so slightly that it actually goes down every year. If we could make contracts like this, and just not have to worry about it because we're not $50 million in the hole because we've been stupid with our cap, this would be, my life would be so perfect if everybody just had this clean contract where, you know, the first year is the lowest year, but it doesn't have like three low years and then just a stupid spike. And then we got to immediately restructure it because we immediately can't pay for you as soon as you get to that point. I'm, I'm so just exhausted with how this con these contracts have, have looked. This Jair contract is just perfection, and we're going to have to mess it up to make room for, and we're probably going to mess it up a lot, because this is where you have the most room. This is the one that doesn't hurt you, and the Packers are in a situation right now where it's like, if your contract isn't, if it doesn't hurt, we're not trying hard enough. So I think they're going to do a pretty big switcheroo on this, probably drop this one down quite a bit. And again, it's really going to bump up 2024, 5, and 6. It'll be spread over three years. But even that, I mean, if we drop it down... 10 million, let's call it nine, which would bring him down to an $11 million cap hit, which is quite low. That would raise it 3 million a year. That would only bring it up to 25, which is a little bit high next year, which we could restructure if we needed to. But again, 23 and a half ish is about where, it, so it, it went up barely. But then the next year would go up to 26, and that's where 28 would be like what 20 is this year. So it already went down. Which again is where you could, you know, if you continue to restructure it or whatever. But even if you dropped him down to 10 million, it really wouldn't hurt that much, I guess is what I'm saying. Which is why I think Jair makes the most sense to really just just slam this one. Anyways, again, um, I'm surprised that I am not getting blown up right now with hey, we have to leave. So I'm gonna go ahead and take that as a uh, an opportunity to get this wrapped up, uploaded, et cetera, et cetera. You guys have a great day, and uh, we'll do more calls, hopefully more than two calls. Um tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye.